This is Deb Donig with Technically Human, a podcast about ethics and technology, where I ask what it means to be human in the age of tech. Each week, I interview industry leaders, thinkers, writers, and technologists, and I ask them about how they understand the relationship between humans and the technologies we create. We discuss how we can build a better vision for technology, one that represents the best of our human values. Hi, Technically Human listeners. We're back with a new season of the show. To kick off the season, we are bringing you the latest episode of our 22 Lessons on Ethics and Technology series, which features interviews with leading thinkers across the humanities and from around the world on the value and challenges of humanistic thinking in our technological age. This week, I'm thrilled to be speaking with Dr. Evelyn Hammonds. Dr. Evelyn Hammonds is the Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science at Harvard University, where she chairs that department and where she is Professor of African and African American Studies. Dr. Hammonds' work focuses on the intersection of scientific, medical, and sociopolitical concepts of race in the United States. Among her many books and articles, she is the author of Childhood's Deadly Scourge, The Campaign to Control Diphtheria in New York City, 1880-1930, published by Johns Hopkins University Press in 1999, and she co-edited the landmark volume Gender and Scientific Authority with Barbara Laslett, Sally G. Colstead, and Helen Longino, published by the University of Chicago Press in 1996. She has published articles on the history of disease, race, and science, African-American feminism, African-American women and the epidemic of HIV AIDS, and analyses of gender and race in science and medicine. She is also the author of the article, Gendering the Epidemic, Feminism and the Epidemic of HIV AIDS in the United States, 1981 to 1999, which appears in Science, Medicine, and Technology in the 20th Century, What Difference Has Feminism Made?, published in 2000. Dr. Hammes is currently completing a history of biological, medical, and anthropological uses of racial concepts, entitled The Logic of Difference, A History of Race in Science and Medicine in the United States, 1850 to 1990. She is also completing the MIT Reader on Race and Gender in Science, co-edited with Rebecca Herzig and Abigail Bass. Professor Hammonds was named a Sigma Xi Distinguished Lecturer from 2003 to 2005 by Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society. She has been a visiting scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin and a fellow at the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton University. In July 2005, Professor Hammonds was named Senior Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity at Harvard University. And in March 2008, Professor Hammonds was named Dean of Harvard College. Professor Hammonds earned a PhD at Harvard University's Department of the History of Science. She also holds an SM in Physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a BEE in Electrical Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and a BS in Physics from Spelman College. Professor Hammonds has been a visiting professor at UCLA and at Hampshire College. She taught at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology before coming to Harvard. While at MIT, she was the founding director of the MIT Center for the Study of Diversity in Science, Technology, and Medicine. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, Deb. So, Evelyn, I want to start off with a question that brings us right into the theme of this series, democracy and public scholarship. Of course, we can't talk about democracy without talking about representation and without talking about the fraught history of uneven representation that animates where we are right now, I think, is as a country. I want to bring this theme into our conversation from the get-go as a sort of frame for thinking about ethics, technology, and human values. I've heard you say, and I'm going to quote you here, I think that we often talk about the diversity problem as opposed to the diversity challenge, because we have so many issues and so many problems that we need to solve. And many of them today involve technology, involve scientific knowledge, scientific expertise, mathematical and quantitative skills. We ought to be trying to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to develop these skills because we're going to need everyone's talents to live in an increasingly technological world. I don't think that we can afford to leave behind big swaths of the American population or the world population for that matter, if we're going to solve these problems. There's a couple of threads that I want to pull out here to lay the groundwork for our conversation. Let's start with the difference between the diversity problem, as you call it, and the diversity challenge, as you would prefer that we call it. How do you understand the difference between the two, especially in the context of scientific and technological problem solving? Why does this distinction between a problem and a challenge matter? 
So the reason that I made that distinction has to do with my longtime work in trying to understand the ways in which the United States scientific and technical workforce has been predominantly white. And the questions that have emerged around that have constantly been, why aren't there more native-born minorities, African-American, Latinx, Asian-Americans in different groups, as well as uh, indigenous Americans in these fields? Often the problem was answered by saying, oh, well, you know, maybe uh, they don't get the right education. Or actually, maybe there's a kind of cultural, technological disingenuity happening in these communities. And so they're not that interested in understanding technology, uh, science, and these kinds of innovations that are occurring in STEM fields. I always thought that those answers were absolutely ridiculous and pointed to the fact that there was some sense that, and I think that a view held by many in the scientific and technical workforce, and by many, I mean a lot of white men who felt that, you know, these people aren't interested, they aren't that serious, and we should not be concerned that they're not here. Well, I was deeply concerned about why there's so many of us were not in these fields. And I've been concerned about it since I was a junior in college at Spelman College and at Georgia Tech. I said, you know, so it's not a problem because the arrow of the problem is pointed toward communities of color as sort of we have some deficit that makes it impossible for us to do this kind of work or interest in this kind of work or the educational or intellectual capacity to do this kind of work. I reject those answers out of hand. And I said, no, the real problem is it's very comfortable for white men to create a kind of homogeneous culture of technological study and innovation that makes them feel comfortable, that allows them to do the work they want to do. And so I wanted to challenge that. And I wanted to say that, you know, I don't want to be the problem. I'm interested in how people of color in this country are treated in these communities, in these cultures of technology and innovation, and why these cultures have become so homogeneous to the point that people don't even question the homogeneity of these communities. But now, I think when I first said that, these questions have become more and more critical. And in a democratic society where a lot of the funding for technology comes from public money, I'm sort of like, I'm a citizen. My people pay taxes. That money goes in to create the the funding for the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, the NIH, all of these different fields. So if you're saying you're going to use public money to support technology and technological innovation, then I want to see my people sitting at the table. I think that you're talking about things that for many years were not talked about and now are big conversations in the public sphere. Why is diversity important for technological production? How does diversity help us to solve the problems that we're trying to solve with technology? So, you know, here's the thing. So I went to Georgia Tech where I did electrical engineering, computer science. Then I go to MIT where I'm doing physics. The provost at MIT at the time I entered in, oh my goodness, 1976, he always said, engineers solve problems. But it was very clear to me, engineers solved the problems that they cared about. The white engineers that surrounded me as one of the three African-American women in the doctoral program in physics at MIT were not problems I was interested in. And I go back to the example that I experienced when I was a student at Georgia Tech. I took my first course on science, technology, and society and human values when I was a senior at Georgia Tech. And that year, the project that we were supposed to address was solar energy. Great. I didn't know anything about solar energy. Learned all about it solar energy panels. Of course, it was of interest in the South where there's a lot of sunlight, et cetera, et cetera. So every student was asked to develop a project. So the project that I developed said, let's put solar energy panels on the buildings in public housing projects. And where I grew up, public housing projects were these long rectangular buildings with absolutely flat roofs. I thought, perfect. Put the panels up on these flat roofs. This would allow poorest people in our community to have access to lower cost heating, right, and cooling systems. And it would be maintained by the federal government because the federal government was, would be interested 
in getting new data from how, how these kinds of new solar energy systems work. I presented my data to the class. I was the only African-American in the class and the only woman in the class. And the class was supposed to grade you on your projects. The students in my class, all white men said, oh my God, no, no, we can't possibly do that. Why would we do that? We can't put our sophisticated equipment around these kind of people. And I thought, oh, so the question was not how you understand the value of contribution of solar energy to reduction of high energy costs. The question that you guys want to talk about was we can't put these new sophisticated equipment around those people. So I thought, okay, I get this. They failed me on my presentation. My two uh, professors were totally embarrassed and said, no, no, Evelyn, it's going to be fine. You, you, that was a wonderful idea. This is great. We're going to give you an A. I said, thank you. And, but then the next week, they asked the students to apologize to me. And the guy said, well, we like you. And, and, and we didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but, you know, so we're sorry, but we're not sure exactly what we're supposed to apologize for. And I thought, really? Huh. Engineers solve problems. They solve the problems that they value. There are lots of problems that need to be solved in our society and worldwide, right? Why do we still have questions about take the Flint, Michigan problem of water supplies, take the issues of, of, of sanitation around the country, take the in energy issues around the country, the, in communities that need uh, new solutions to use of infrastructure that is aging and failing. Who's going to answer those questions? Who's going to ask them? Who's going to demand that public monies be, be used to support new innovations, technological innovations that would help us uh, have a society where those kinds of resources are more equitably distributed? So that's where I learned that engineers solve problems that they care about. White engineers solve the problems they care about. But we need different people at the table who say, wait a minute, there's a problem in my community where you guys don't know anything about that I want to solve. That means we have to get ourselves well-educated. We have to develop our technological and quantitative skills. And then we have to say, these are the problems we care about. And if you don't care about them, we're going to work on them. And we're going to bring new ideas and new solutions to the table. So that's why I said, uh, said it the way I did. I mean, this is fascinating. I'm very interested in this narrative that you tell where you start out at Spelman, you're at Georgia Tech, you're at MIT, you're designing a solar panel and energy efficiency projects, and then you become a historian whose work focuses on the intersection of scientific, medical, and sociopolitical concepts of race in the United States. I'm getting a sense of what led you want to explore this intersection, but what led you to want to explore this in the historical dimension? How has this led you to discussions of technology in the context of the prism of history? Oh, I had that experience at Georgia Tech, which I described. And secondly, I go to MIT where, and, and the only reason that I applied to MIT is the only graduate school I applied to. Uh, and I just want to say to the audience, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I applied to MIT and I got in, thank God. But Congratulations. The reason that I applied to MIT was because Shirley Jackson, who's among the, the first African American woman to get a PhD in physics, graduated from MIT. She came to Spelman and she was part of recruiting me to think about coming to MIT. When I met her, I was like, why would I go anywhere else? Shirley went there. None of these other schools has ever produced an African-American woman with a PhD in physics. I was walking around school to my friends who remember this, and I'd say, I'm going to be a physicist. And they would go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I realized it was like an abstraction because I didn't know any Black women physicists. I went to the library and I said, I'd like to check out all the books about Black women scientists. And they said, there are no books about Black women scientists. This is in the 1970s. And then I met Shirley. I'm like, well, okay, then. Uh, so I had to go to MIT. So I had to work really, really hard, which I did. And I did get admitted to MIT. And of course, one of the first things that happened, I'd be walking down the hallways of the Infinite Corridor and people would say, hey, Shirley, how's your work going? And I go, really? Uh, okay, my work is going fine. Because <laughs> there's no point in trying to stop somebody on the Infinite Corridor and explain to them that I was not Shirley Jackson. Okay, fine. But that kind of way in which I walked into MIT at the pinnacle of a Research One institution 
in scientific and technical fields. And I began to feel increasingly isolated. I felt that I was asked to fit into a particular mold of what a physicist was supposed to be and leave behind that I was an African-American woman who had many other commitments besides physics. And so I needed to understand why I was facing that particular cultural uh, challenge. And so I'd ask my professor about it, and I would talk to him all the time about it, and he'd say, you know what, Evelyn, these are not physics problems. And I said, you know what, they are physics problems for me, because I don't know if I can do this if I don't understand why is the American scientific and technical workforce so white and male. I don't understand. Somebody give me some kind of way to understand this and some kind of pathway to try to change it. And I couldn't find it. So what I decided to do is do the first two sets of my experiments that I had planned for my doctoral degree, turn it in as a master's thesis, because I was going to have to take a break and figure out what was going on, which I did. And um, I also worked as a software engineer at the time. I worked on uh, Project Athena, which was the project that was established at MIT, funded by IBM and Microsoft and other groups. I worked on the first instantiation of different platforms for Windows. Or as my son says, mom, you did the wrong thing going back to get a PhD. It's just like, <laughs> we could have had a Tesla by now, mom. We could have had a Tesla. That was a real error. <laughs> and I said, but son, I'm happy with what I do. So during the time that I was, I was trying to find my way through, many of the feminist science scholars that I was engaged with in Cambridge kept saying, you, you have to go back and get your PhD. And they said, you know, it looks like it's history of science now, because that's the place where you can look at the ways in which race and gender shape the production of scientific knowledge. And those very concepts themselves are created and sustained and shaped by different kinds of scientists. So that's why I went into the history of science. I certainly never dreamed when I did that, that I would end up being the chair of the Department of History of Science. But uh, it was the right choice, despite what my son says. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel very positive about the ways in which I've been able to contribute to understanding the underrepresentation of Native-born minorities STEM fields. Well, condolences to your son on the loss of his Tesla, but I can speak, I think, for a great many of us in the humanities say we're very glad you made the choice that you made. And one of the reasons that I was so excited to have you on this show as a historian focused on this intersection is because when I talk to people what ethical technology means in practice, I always start off by saying that any ethical approach to technological production requires an understanding of history. You have to know how we got here to this point. And more precisely, the history of ideas, particularly the history of how science is produced and the reasons and the I want to say diversity challenges through which science has historically been produced. Do you agree with this? And if so, how do you think about the relationship between knowing and in your role in particular, helping other people understand the history of ideas in this arena and ethical practice in the present? You know, I think the historical perspective is really, really important because most people do not understand how we can be in the 21st century still talking about profound underrepresentation of African Americans, Latinx peoples, some groups of Asian Americans and indigenous uh, Americans in scientific and technical fields. The myths of incapacity or disinterest or disingenuity get to stand unchallenged. But if you have a historical practice, you need to understand something that I think is very important. Edward Boucher was the first African-American man to get a PhD in physics from Yale in the 1870s. And then you contrast that with Shirley Jackson being one of the first African-American women to get a PhD in the 1970s in physics. What is that gap about? Don't we need to understand that gap? And it's not simply one, and it can't possibly be one, that is about deficit models that, you know, incapacity and the kinds of things I've mentioned before. There are systemic structural reasons that have to do 
with the ways in which our society in the United States is structured around issues of race, structured around issues of class, structures around uh, issues of ethnicity. And therefore, people who have the talent to work in STEM fields have been systematically prevented from contributing their talent to these fields. Let's continue to ask Clark. One of the things that we know from some of the work in the history of science is the historically Black colleges and universities, many of them formed in the late 19th century. But the white leaders of American higher education said these would be schools that would teach the newly freed enslaved peoples how to do, you know, sort of hands-on work. They should be technicians. They could do that kind of labor because, of course, they did not have the capacity to do higher levels of intellectual work in these fields. A wonderful paper written by W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American intellectual, is called The Negro Scientist. And it was published in uh, the American Quarterly, which was the journal of the Phi Beta Kappa. And he asked the question, he said, he starts it by saying, you know, so uh, it's commonly asked by white people that he was in contact with. So, you know, Negroes have made advances in music and art and letters and politics and various things. They've not made advances in quantitative fields. Perhaps the Negro doesn't have the quantitative habit of mind to do scientific work. And it prompted Du Bois to say, uh, no, I can tell you about very many African-Americans who've tried to do scientific work and the ways in which they were blocked from making their contributions. And he goes on to document a number of those people in his essay. At the end, he concludes, he's saying, you know, here's the thing. Maybe, maybe we should just say, forget about all this. Maybe we should just say, Negroes have a lot of other things they need to do, socially useful work. And we shouldn't worry about whether they do science or engineering or produce new inventions. But he said, you know what? But science depends on the perspective and the work of very talented individuals. And nowhere is more needed in this country than African-American people doing science. And I quote from that essay all the time. I think he's powerful. Why would we close off a door to anybody who has the talent, determination, and persistence to tackle some of the most serious and intractable problems that our society faces. Unless it's a society that's structured in racism that says, you know, we're fine. We don't actually need what you guys have to say. And I think you're talking here about the state of where we are right now with technological culture. Because one of my hopes for this series is that I'm translating ideas from the humanities to people who are in technological production. Maybe you can help me put a finer point on it. Are there histories of ideas that you think are particularly critical for people, particularly people in industry, to know and understand or be aware of when participating in technological innovation, ideation, and production? So the the thing that I try to point to is there's a way in which scientific and technological production that happens in sort of group community settings require a degree of trust between the members of those communities. They share values, they share ideas, they share particular kinds of uh, knowledge of technological tools. And that sharing, right, in communities that, I'm not trying to spin a story for you, but just look at various groups. Who was surrounded about around Steve Jobs? Who did he surround himself with? Who did Bill Gates surround himself with? When they're doing their foundational work, people like them, they could trust them, push them to push the ideas to particular boundaries. They trusted the interaction and thus extended that trust to the work itself. Now, let's talk about diverse groups. For generations of engineers, Diversity in those groups, you know, the, if you're the one person of color, there's a kind of suspicion. Think about scenes from Hidden Figures, right? When Katherine Johnson is in that room where she goes to the chalkboard and starts writing her equations and the guys sort of sit back and stare. Well, you know, they're like, can we trust those equations? They go look at it. They're not quite sure because the trust in the production of knowledge is key to everybody coming together to say, 
this is the right way to do it, even if the person doing it is presenting the right kind of mathematics, the, the unambiguous sort of objective response, right? But you see in Hidden Figures, which I think is wonderful in the movie form of showing this, these Black women are like, there's such cultural anomalies in those scenes. The cultural difference translates into their unreliability as scientific and technical producers of knowledge. So we have lots of homogeneous scientific and technical communities, and they feel good. People in those communities feel good about how they do their work, and they're successful, and they break boundaries, and they produce new knowledge. And then they look and say, oh, well, you want us to take in these other people? Who are these other people? Are they like us? Are they not like us? And what does that mean? And that's stuff that doesn't get articulated. It's just above how these groups operate. And one of the things I've always been struck by, I'll tell you a story. The first Gordon conference I went to when I was a physics student at MIT, these are conferences you go to in the summertime, often some beautiful place in the middle of the woods, and you talk physics all day long and stuff like that. So at the end, you produce a picture, a photograph of the, everybody who was there. And of course, I was the only African-American woman in, in the picture at my Gordon conference. My mother looks at the picture and she says, where are you? And I'm like, I'm right there. And I have a very short Afro, so my hair is very cropped, big glasses, a pocket protector in a button-down collar shirt and khaki pants. And I'm standing next to somebody and I'm not a very dark-skinned person. And so the picture was sort of faded. And I said, there I am. She said, oh my God, you look just like them. I had no idea that on a subconscious level, I dressed so I fit. The more I became engaged in feminist theory and thought, I'm thinking, oh, no, 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 no. What I'm doing is taking away from my race, my gender, uh, my other aspects of my social identity to fit so that they could be comfortable with me being in their presence. They shouldn't be made uncomfortable. The moment of that is past. Now, those, the production of these comfortable communities of the production of scientific technologies such that white men feel comfortable and everybody else has to feel weird and distant and wrong is over. I hear from you that that was a pivot point for you. Do you think that our culture has reached that pivot point? I don't think so. I actually think there's a lot of work to do. Can you give us a sense of what that work looks like and what a better vision for technological production looks like in your view? So a better vision for me is that, you know, a lot of programs that are designed to increase the numbers of people of color in STEM fields, starting from K through 12, through undergraduate education, through postgraduate education, through, you know, people going into different fields uh, through, you know, industrial pathways, depend on asking, as I just described, asking the people of color to change to fit an existing system. And as you do that, these programs actually, I think, take away and help to diminish the kind of innate creativity that people came to do these fields in the first place. And I think that's wrong. So I think we need to be telling a different narrative, not that we want people of color or young students of color to fit into this culture that I have, I'm exaggerating to some extent, but not too much into these cultures that that are very different from them. But actually we say, you have an idea, you have an interest, you have capacity and skills, work on the problems that matter to you. Stop this trying to fit into cultures that do not want to hear from you. And I think the more we do that, the more we will allow the kind of untapped, unrestrained engagement from people from all over the place who have interesting and profound ideas about solving the problems that face our world. And one of the things that your professional career trajectory and some of the things that you've just said have made clear to me is that part of that creativity is as well breaking down disciplinary boundaries. Absolutely. You can't think about physics. You can't think about technological production. You can't think about clean energy without thinking about the history of the way people have thought about clean energy, the people who have been excluded from those conversations, the way that the outcomes and the technological products have been hobbled 
by divisive and oftentimes incredibly discriminatory thinking. And for many of us in the academy, we work in institutions that have, for many decades, divided the humanities from the sciences so that the history of science is sequestered in many ways from the practice uh, of science, for example. I always like to describe my time as a graduate student at UCLA as a tale of what I call, with reference to Charles Dickens, two cities. If you were a student or an academic working in the sciences, you lived in South Campus where they had functional air conditioning and the AV system uh, always worked. And if you worked in the humanities, uh, you never went to South Campus. You lived on (laughs) North Campus where the AV system and the air conditioning were always questionable and most of the time broken, but where we had a sculpture garden and gargoyles and Gothic architecture. Um, But it wasn't always that way, right? right? Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is as famous for his anatomical discoveries as for his artwork. Descartes was a philosopher and a mathematician. The knowledge of the sciences was essential to these thinkers' aesthetic and humanistic knowledge and and vice versa. As somebody who has expertise in both uh, scientific and humanistic thought and who works across that divide and whose thinking is essential, I think, and critical interventions into both of these arenas. What response do you get when you present your ideas to folks who are practicing medicine, science, and technology? Are they receptive to your ideas? Do you get pushback? Up until the last two years, if I spoke to audiences predominantly of engineers, for example, or if I, I've done over the years different conversations with Physicists who still kind of embrace me, surprise, surprise, (laughs) Um, especially after the movie Hidden Figures came out. And they began to have some kind of real understanding of the kind of discriminatory practices they had been engaged in. But also, I do think that in the United States in particular, the need for understanding of history, of literature, and for me, of the work of many writers is so important. Colson Whitehead's The Intuitionist is one of my favorite books to to teach. And this is about what what was one of the central characters is an African-American woman elevator engineer, right? And using that as a sort of trope to get at questions, you know, more existential questions about the relationship between humans and machines. I find those kind of conversations really important because I think that what we've developed a kind of technological educational system that says that we ask engineers in particular, I would put it this way, to act as if they're standing above culture, that they're not bringing their own particular interests and desires for different kinds of societies or different kinds of problems they want to solve. They're not articulating them explicitly and putting them on the table. And I want them on the table. But once you put them on the table, it means that the tools of engineering sciences are not going to necessarily help you address those questions. The example I would give is this. September 11, okay, I was teaching at MIT. Of course, it was a profound, world-changing moment. At MIT, they decided to have uh, community conversations on the day after where lots of faculty members were engaged with small groups of students. And they just divided us up in, you know, whatever kind of ways. The group that I had said, but Professor Hammonds, who were those people? Who did this? It's low tech. It's not high tech. They just turned an airplane into a bomb. But why? And what does it mean? And why does it matter? And I thought, here we go. This is our moment as humanist interdisciplinary scholars to say, you need to understand how the people who are responsible for this horrific event, think about the world and think specifically about the use of technology. This is the moment. This is the moment when we are the humanists, people in a history, literature, religion, all of these people should have been in the classroom saying, this is why it matters to you as engineers and technical and specifically people in technological fields. And I thought we missed that moment nationally and even locally because the students were sitting there going, I can't imagine who this could have been who did this. I'm like, you don't get to other them. And maybe you don't understand when I I use that language of othering. What does that mean? 
It's a way in which you distance other people and put them in categories that require you not to have empathy from where they're from because you don't know anything about them and they don't know anything about you, perhaps. And so it was a moment where, to me, the need for deeply intertwined humanistic and technological work needed to come together if we were going to make a different future. And I think we missed that opportunity. But that that moment is seared in my body because the engineering students were asking certain kinds of questions that nothing in the MIT curriculum spoke to the questions that they were asking. So I have a question about the curriculum at Harvard, which is where you are now. I I know that Dr. James Mickens in particular is doing really phenomenal and interesting work in the arena of computer science, bringing ethics and bringing humanistic inquiry into the computer science departments and teaching that as part of the curriculum as a really innovative, I think, new way of thinking about that. How do you think about that kind of model and that kind of curriculum of bringing humanities scholarship into computer science? Because there's a thought that I have sometimes, which is that humanities people are well-trained and spend eight to 10 years of their lives getting advanced degrees so that they can speak to this vast body of knowledge. Sometimes they get asked to speak on AI ethics panels. And we spend five minutes talking about AI and the next 55 (laughs) minutes talking about ethics. And it's as though these computer scientists think that they have invented new questions about whether or not trolleys should hit one person or five people. (laughs) And I have to remind them that people have spent quite some time thinking about these histories, that there's a large and very rich tradition about these issues and questions as people thought them through already and that they're not inventing these ideas and that perhaps they should be taking some classes from you or for other people in the humanities. So there's another model that occurs to me in which computer science students take ethical technology classes from trained humanists in the humanities rather than bringing an occasional humanities lesson to computer science curriculum. What do you think about this? I think this is wrongheaded. The humanities should not be the handmaiden of technology and explain to them the humanistic aspects of their work. This needs to be a very serious intersectional situation where computer scientists need to question all the basic premises of the terms they use, especially now with AI and algorithmic research. And so uh, we were just having a conversation in the history of science department today in a department of colloquium where one of my colleagues was invited to uh, the Office of Technology and Science Policy, headed now by Eric Lander, who is uh, head of the Broad Institute, and by the deputy director, Alondra Nelson, who's a science technology and society a scholar who is one of my students. Here's the thing. We have to make sure and try to really insist that we stop making a very artificial divide. I think students in the humanities, the social sciences, the qualitative social sciences need to understand technological issues and how those issues are framed in the terms that are prevalent in the discipline right now and vice versa. We need to open up the technological disciplines to a self-critical tradition of research. Why do we think we can just put an algorithm up and say, okay, let's find a data set and train it on that without understanding what that data set is, what's in it, why the things that are in it are in it, what is your goal in analyzing and creating algorithms that can move through certain data sets, because one of the key issues, and this connects to something else I work on with respect to race, a lot of data sets that are produced, uh, collecting data that address social problems or even health issues, those data sets are very flawed. They don't have socioeconomic data. They have race, they have ethnicity, they have a certain way of talking about um, sex. They don't have necessarily categories for disability. And if you want to train, quote unquote, an algorithm on them, what the algorithm will learn is race. It will learn the race that's already embedded in them. The algorithm doesn't have a way to question. So the people producing the algorithms have to learn how to question. They don't do that unless they've studied history. 
and sociology and the social determinants of health issues if, if it's a health database. So these things can't be separated in this way if you expect the technological prowess that new algorithms produced in AI can produce by looking at millions and millions of data sets, but what's in them is not questioned. They're going to reproduce the social world we already have. I want to push a little bit further into this because you and I were chatting offline before we started recording about a, a, an important uh, press release coming out tomorrow, specifically on the point of data. And I've been thinking quite a bit about data, particularly insofar as our data sets are cold from the past. They are history. And when they are enlisted in service of something like an algorithm, they encode that history into the present in order to pre-program the present and then to anticipate and produce futures. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this press release coming out tomorrow and the important intervention that your work is proceeding to take in the context of thinking about the way we handle and use and enlist data in the service of technological production. Thank you. So tomorrow, uh, the National Academies of Science will be releasing a press release on a new report that I was the co-chair of on transforming technologies, women of color in tech. And what we did in this report was talk about the ways in which a lot of federal programs, also private programs, have been developed to try to increase the representation of women of color in technological fields. But when people say women in those fields, they typically mean white women. When they say minorities, they typically mean uh, men. And what has continued to happen over and over again is the experience the, the challenges that women of color face get lost. And the data is never disaggregated so that we can see how many women of color in particular subfields of tech, that is computer technology, information technology fields, all of these fields, we can't see that because the data isn't collected properly. So that the lived experiences of those women goes unquestioned and unanalyzed. We called for in this report, one of the major findings is we must ask federal agencies and industry organizations to start collecting data and disaggregating the data so that we can see what has happened for women of color because we can't produce effective policies to increase their representation in these fields if we don't know what's happening for them. And the data does not exist for us to do that in any reliable and systematic and robust way. So we're very proud of this report. And uh, I was one of the co-chairs along with Valerie Taylor, who uh, is director of one of the major areas at the Argonne National Laboratory. And so I encourage everyone to uh, take a look at it because I think it is our first opportunity to say that women of color and the experiences they face and the need to change the experience they currently face of a lot of bias and discrimination in order for them to uh, provide the talent and work that they are capable of doing. And we will link to the report and to the press release in our show notes. And I think that this project is particularly important. It leads right to my next question because it constellates and in many ways, I think, elevates the significance of humanistic thinking and historical thinking in the space of the import of technological production and technological tools and technological utilities. What do people in STEM, doctors, engineers, technologists, students, and practitioners of these professions miss about humanistic thinking? One way to think about it is, I'll use a personal example again. When I was studying physics, I studied physics because I really wanted to understand, quote unquote, how the world works. So I wanted to understand, for example, Newton's laws. I was fascinated by this. I thought, wow, so this is how you understand gravity or acceleration, all the sort of canonical terms of the me mechanical universe. And then when I studied the history of science, and I learned in those studies about when Newton was developing Newton's laws, it was in a social context, 17th century England. This way of thinking about the world was not the common way of thinking about the world. Some people said, well, gravity, that's just the invisible hand of God. What do you mean, this mechanical force called gravity, you can't see it? What, do you mean, what are you talking about? And I thought, oh my goodness, of course somebody might ask that question. 
I mean, I accepted it because I thought, oh, I'm a math geek and I think that, that makes sense. But in context, you learn that, wait a minute, why would you accept that? Why would anybody accept it? Why would the mathematical sets of equations that quote unquote prove that there's something like this? Well, who decides that's real proof? Who questioned? Who didn't question? Who accepted? Who didn't accept? Who are these guys? Who was Newton after all, right? We're learning Newton's laws. And who, who the hell was Newton, right? And once I got into that frame, then I realized science is done in context. and how we learn how the world works is also done in context. And the story that historians can tell about that depends on who the historian is telling the story as well. And so my world exploded. I thought there's so many, many other questions. I thought, well, is Newton the first person who ever thought about that? Were there other people who thought about it? Were there certain kinds of scholars in African context who thought about it. Let's talk about the um, the creation of the pyramids. They had to understand something, both about geometry and gravity and a whole kind of other things, that they are now structures that have lasted over millennia. How did they do that? And so my world became a question of how did this happen? Why did it happen? Who saw it? Who believed it? Who didn't believe it? Who supported it? Who was excluded? Why were women's voices excluded? Why were women of color voices excluded? How did this happen around the world? Why can you see the Great Wall of China from outer space? How did they figure out to produce a structure that you could see from outer space? And my world became the questions of why this, why that, but then had to be rooted in the context of the times. And it, it just exploded for me. And as my friends will tell you, in that first moment of that explosion, I was not a very nice person to be around because all I did was carry my books around and say to them over dinner, did you know this? Did you understand <laughs> that? How do we get here? And they go, could you just give it us a break? I mean, can we just have dinner? And I go, no, 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 no. This is really, really important <laughs> to understand. So my always my ultimate goal as a kid is I wanted to understand how the world worked and why these questions. I had a whole set of books that my parents brought me and they were called How and Why. I've been asking how and why since I was six years old. And those are the questions that make us wonderful academics and, and terrible dinner <laughs> companions exactly. at times. Exactly. I suppose um, I should ask you the inverse of the question. You know, I asked you what people in STEM may not understand about the humanities, but of course you are trained as a person of STEM education as well. So I want to ask you the reverse. As somebody who is trained as an engineer, what do people in the humanities miss or misunderstand? In the humanities, I think the way that humanistic scholarship and questions about some of these issues have been changing in the last decade. You see more questions that look like history of science questions showing up in essays by people in English departments. I just had that experience myself. I wrote an essay almost 30 years ago called Black Holes and the Genealogy of Black Female Sexuality. And I was using the trope of a black hole to try to explain a present absence. And recently, an English scholar at Harvard wrote another paper about black holes, having not read mine, but she's also trying to use it as a metaphor to explain a particular set of configurations around Black female sexuality. And we are coming together. We're going to have a conversation next spring about this, our, our two essays. And so I think it was really important to take away from this, I hope we take away from this conversation, is that humanists need to move into a world that the STEM folks have occupied and say, well, why do you think the world works this way? What do these kind of metaphors, analogies, tropes that you use to explain the world actually say about not just STEM, but a broader world? Can we think about the ways in which, as I uh, just referenced, uh, Black female sexuality is characterized, that it should make us wonder about how we describe the agency or pathology of various 
human endeavors that we should question. And it's not just going from the humanist to the STEM and asking about how you use particular metaphors. But I think there's been a wall where the humanist is like, well, they do what they do. We do what we do. We don't have to cross over. For me, I am deeply enlivened and animated by the ways in which humanists, particularly poets and other humanist scholars have begun to ask, so what is human ethicists as well? And so if you guys are sitting over here starting to say, well, you know, we, can, we got this new ways of thinking about the ways in which we could use parts of pigs in human bodies to do certain kinds of things. And what is that human body that now has a pig part in it? Is it human? Is it human animal? What is it? And the philosophical, ethical, moral questions there are profound. Who gets to know how to think about that? And I think those are the moments where I think right now, because of the advance of certain kinds of technological innovations, that we need people who are willing to question not just what we can do, but what we ought to do or ought not to do moving forward, what we're capable of understanding about the plasticity of humans and the plasticity of animals or sentient beings, or not sentient beings, or these are questions that people who have the technological prowess to move us in certain directions need to be concerned with, as well as the humanists who need to say, what is it that, what do do those guys think they're doing? And why do they think they're doing it? And what do they think it means? It has to be in conversation with one another. We can't wait till the production of something Let's not use Frankenstein as a metaphor and that we derive every conversation about this from from uh, that moment. But we need more and more moments where we're asking, even right now, I would ask, is Zoom the way we want to do this conversation? Is podcasting the way? I mean, what are we doing? Is this the best way for us communication? Is there something post-Zoom that we ought to be thinking about? And why? And what is it about the Zoom part that's, problematic versus the non I mean, we are in the midst of making major changes without asking questions about what do these changes cost? How do they affect us as human beings? Is communication better, worse, not better? I, I don't know. But we ought to be having all of that at the same time. I can't think about interdisciplinarity, which is what we're talking about here, and the important questions that come up about what we can or should or ought to do without also thinking about intersectionality. And I've heard you say in an interview, and I'm going to quote you here, because of the small numbers of women of color in feminist studies of science, the work has not been challenged to grapple with race or ethnicity. I think that we could say that the tech industry is only perhaps uh, now grappling in any serious way with both gender and race and ethnicity. The key term that comes to mind here is that term intersectionality. Intersectionality, just for our listeners, is a term that Professor Kimberly Crenshaw coined to describe the way that different forms of social inequity or disadvantage are impacted by belonging to other identity categories. And I believe uh, Professor Crenshaw's context for thinking about intersectionality was law. How do you think about intersectionality in tech and science? Are there specific questions or concerns about intersectionality that come up in these two arenas that are unique to the context of tech and science that we should understand? Oh, absolutely. I mean, here's the thing that I hope the the narrative arc we've been talking about in this wonderful conversation suggests that here I was and am a young uh, African, not so young anymore, African-American woman from the American South coming to MIT and saying, These are the questions I want to understand and how I want to understand them. And finding that people were like, oh, those aren't the right questions. Well, why do you think that question is important versus the questions we think are important? And how do you prove that that those questions are important? And looking at me as a suspect interlocutor, right? Because I'm not them. I'm an African-American woman and subsequently lesbian, feminist, scholar, et cetera. And I have a particular perspective that I'm bringing to why I want certain questions and I want to explore certain questions 
that cross boundaries between the world of science and technology and the worlds of, of humanistic inquiry, uh, and literature, and history. Because I live an intersectional life. I can't shut the door to one part of me. Again, the how or why questions. You know, how do we come to this point where certain kinds of technological development is largely determined by often fairly young, fairly unaware, people unaware of history and sociology and literature and all these things, except for science fiction, are actually doing things that actually have profound impact on how the world works. And they get to do it without having to deal with the consequences, social, political, moral, philosophical, of what they do. As a person who sits in that intersection, I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me because of the worlds that I live in, which are always intersectional. It causes me to question and challenge those worlds. And I want those worlds to come together as they do in my own personal life at a higher level, because I think the life that I live as an intersectional person is the life that many, many people in this world live. And that notion needs to become the central animating theme of everything we all do. I think when we talk about intersectionality, one of the things we talk about, and perhaps this is true of our larger conversation, is the way that equity is distributed across different segments of the population and the way that that coincides within individuals. And a premise of this series on ethics and technology is that there is a relationship, a strong relationship between ethics and equity. What do you make of this? And do you see that bearing out in your research? If so, how do you understand ethics in this sense, in the context of science and tech? You ask me to disaggregate something that I, I don't actually know how to disaggregate. The ethical aspect we can, we can often try to talk about the ethical aspect with respect to um, technology and, and STEM as something that would be separate from ordinary practice. It's not separate. It's embedded in ordinary practice. Our practices of doing science and technology and production of scientific and technological knowledge always has an ethical component. And I think this particular moment should make us more aware of the ethical dimension. We we were talking before we started recording about, you know, thinking about our students in this moment of remote learning. Well, one of the things we've had to think about is how many of our students live in a world where everybody in the household has their own laptop. They'll live in a world where everybody has access to broadband, so they get high-speed internet. They'll live in a world where social distancing, which was an essential public health practice, is actually even possible that all of this has an ethical aspect to it. If we had thought, public health experts had said, not everybody needs to social distance, but what makes social distancing possible? There were different practices that would have followed from doing that, saying it that way, that we didn't say it that way. Or Let's put all elementary school kids on Zoom. Well, what does that mean? And it happened without any sense of, like I said, who has the computer? Who understands how to do it? Does everybody have access to broadband enough to do it or Wi-Fi and all these things? And what do we do about the people who do not? Was there ever not an ethical question here? There was always an ethical question. Whether we dealt with it, That's another story. Whether it happened in a political context that was fraught and difficult, absolutely. But there was never not an ethical question at the center of this. And this is challenging for me because I think that the people making those decisions, particularly the technological decisions, are not bad people. They're good people who I think would genuinely want to do better. And so what advice would you give to folks in the tech industry who are making decisions about technological production or ideation? who genuinely want to work in alignment with equity and ethics, who are perhaps listening to this episode, learning about the history and the context that your work provides, and who genuinely want to do better. What ought they to know or think about as they build and imagine and implement technologies? What questions would you want them to ask or answer before they build tech cultures or tech products? 
I can give uh, many answers to that depending on the day and depending on the time of day and depending on the fact that this is the last day of classes at the end of a very long (laughs) and difficult semester. Congratulations. Uh, But I would say also that people in tech fields need to understand how to ask different questions. Every time you make a decision, you should ask a question about what does this mean? So I, when I started out in uh, computer science, what, what, what the first language I learned was Fortran, uh, formula, what is it, formula translator, maybe is what the, is the shorthand for. But anyway, there used to be uh, an abort command. I don't know a single woman that I was, when we were learning that language, who didn't kind of recoil every time we was like, abort the program. Why? Because it had a social meaning for us. And the guys who were using it obviously didn't seem to have a social meaning for them. But are there other ways to say stop program other than abort? Really, the social and the technological are imbricated. There's no reason why it had to be called abort. It just had to signal stop now. And if you have a sense of the social meaning, maybe a lot of people who were involved in developing that language might have said, yeah, let's not do it that way. Let's not call it that. Let's call it something else. Or slave processes. A printer could extend a certain kind of printing processes from the central processor could be called a slave process because the central processor controlled those auxiliary processes. You have to call it slave? Really? And you act like, oh, come on, that's just a way of saying it. No, it's not. Not for me, with my heritage, and a board, not for both of us who are female. I mean, really? And so the fact that those could be instantiated in programming guides and programming textbooks and programming classes without question is the ways in which these fields have developed without being required to consider the social consequences and implications of how they describe the work. What one core lesson do you want to advocate for as a lesson on ethics and tech that you want listeners to take forward as we move deeper into the 21st century? I would like the boundaries between the world of technology and the world of humanistic scholarship to be brought down like the Berlin Wall, that we no longer say that there is some kind of disciplinary boundary uh, that should exist and we support it by the ways in which we do things and the ways in which we question. And that at this point in the 21st century, all as an educator, all students should be required to understand the technological world and all students should be asked to understand the ways in which humanists understand the world. Not and or, not one over the other, but both. Thank you very much, Evelyn. The 22 Lessons in Ethical Technology series is co-sponsored by the National Science Foundation and the Cal Poly Strategic Research Initiative Grant Award. The show is written, hosted, and produced by me, Deb Donig, with production support from Matthew Harsh and Lee St. John. Thanks to Jake Garner and Emma Zimbro for production coordination. Our head of research for the series is Sakina Nuruddin. Our editor is Carrie Caulfield Eric. To learn more about the 22 Lessons on Ethical Technology series, visit www.etcalpoly.org. And don't forget to subscribe to the show to make sure you don't miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 